on our executive committee of this conference, by the way, who will be presenting a tutorial on flexible computing. So, Daniel obtained his telecommunication engineering degree from Carlos Tree University of Madrid 10 years ago, 2003, a little bit more than that. He joined the telematic engineering department in 2004 as a researcher, cooperating with provided computing lab team in some European projects, for example, UPSEC and Trust ES. He continued with his research activities while he prepared his master and PhD degrees. He obtained his master degree in telematics in 2006 and his PhD in 2008. Very fast. Now he is an associate professor of the telematic engineering department at the same university. In 2009, Daniel was given a special PhD award from Universidad Carlos III and the best PhD thesis award on electronic commerce from La Caixa. Daniel is a member of IEEE, awarded with IEEE Chester Soul Award, and a co-author of more than 50 international publications. Among these publications are contributions to computer networks, telecommunication system journal, transactions on consumer electronics. Besides, he contributed also to several companies organized by IEEE, ACM, and IFIE. Dr. Sanchez's research interests are focused on pervasive computing security. The aim is to provide a seamless secure interaction infrastructure for personal limited devices to overcome security protocol limitations, especially for constant protection, and to provide service neighbors to access services in a secure fashion in high distributed networks. So, please welcome Dr. Daniel Sanchez. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to start this, this talk today. Since it has been a long time preparing this uh, flexible computer framework I'm going to present today. <clears throat> so the first thing of the presentation I want you to know is that uh, this is yet another cooperation framework. Okay? It's not the only that is out there, it's not the only working, but it's the one we need with a lot of effort and a lot of time. So, uh, when I was uh, asked to, to do a tutorial here in the ICT, I just uh, say, okay, come on, why not uh, telling the people what we did and why we did that, okay? Try to uh, show you what motivated us, I mean, the scenarios that triggered this development, also which is our approach, because it may be not the best one, but this one that fits to our purpose. And, uh, of course, uh, some hints on how we faced some problems in practice. So, my, my first idea was, in principle, to bring also a copy of the framework, okay? It's published on the internet, but just a limited version of it, because we have some problems with the copyrights. But I, I, I hope, if you are interested, that we can make, make it, uh, make a list of how we will be able to provide this uh, in the near future, okay? So you can play with it. So, this is the outlook of the presentation. I, I would first want to show you why we did that. So it's a small motivation. Just having a look to the media, that is one of the, of the concepts around the, the cooperation framework. And also social networks that are quite important. Then whenever we, we speak about flexible computing, just a couple of words that should be there describe the computing. Because this is not another thing but just a way of making this cloud computer, but not in the cloud. So I will go get through the concept regarding cloud computing. Despite we maybe have it pretty clear, I really want to just uh, focus. I want you to focus on some aspects that are not, uh, let's say, uh, valid for making a flexible computing using small, small devices. Then we will have a little role of the device in cloud systems and some scenarios actually those that trigger this event. Then I will show you the design principles of the lightweight marketing use system as well as the, some hints of implementation. I will see uh, one example, working example. And finally the, the conclusion. So I, I hope you like it. In regards to the questions, 
I would tell you that just please ask me whatever you have one, okay? Don't necessarily wait until the end. So I will be more, more constructive. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go for the motivation. If we have a look to the most popular internet services that used to change over the year, year there's a, 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 a media page that always which are the most uh, famous, the most uh, active one. So it changed every year. So fortunately, this is a very deep market, very deep research, uh, research gap, so it's pretty difficult to be on this list for a long time. However, whenever we have a look to it, we always find some common points, and one of them is social networking, always is present somehow. And there's one that is present and is becoming more and more active every year, is uh, personal media sharing, just people are starting to be active broadcasters of their life, pictures and videos to other places. So, if we have a look to the multimedia evolution, it's one of the, the most, uh, let's say, big, one of the biggest motivations of this, this work. So, uh, the first thing we have a look to is the TV. Okay? The TV, as we used to know it, changed uh, dramatically in these few years. So, uh, in the past, we, we used to have a clear role station as said in this uh, very good uh, publication called When TV Died, we will go to the cloud. So the thing is that uh, the roles are responsibility that used to be very clear to everybody and now absolutely uh, different. So the thing that the changes we are, we, are have, we are looking at today is that the, this, uh, I mean, this is the end of the playing on TV. So there's no clear frontiers among uh, producers, distributors and consumers. And that's a big convergence because we have multiple uh, sources from many places that need to be mixed uh, with many other contents, especially with the user-generated content is uh, the most important part of this. Um, so in the end, being a, a producer, distributor, distributor or any other, uh, adopting any other role of this multimedia producer is not, uh, it's, it's not like the, the privilege. So, uh, starting with the playing on TV, we used to have producers, distributors, and users that were terminals in the end because the, the concept of user, the, the personalization, is something that is almost new in this, in this work. So, what we have, I, I was identified by my, let's say, my, by my TV. My TV didn't react because I was the one who was uh, watching the TV. And if anybody is at my side watching TV also, the, the show is going to be the same. Okay, nowadays we have any sort of organization that is uh, used not to be there. With the time, with the hybrid TV or the old-fashioned TV, plus hype TV, we started having more and more uh, services. The, the most important part is the users started to be well identified by uh, an STV. An STV that had a sub subscription with a number, probably a sort of keys, something like that. Something you will be able to uh, identify as a subscriber, not exactly a user, that is something better than no identification at all. Then we have more services, video on demand, your video on demand, catch up TV, and other thing. Unfortunately, there were a lot of standardization efforts. Then this moved to a new area of uh, devices in which we used to have a lot of different devices with different. Uh, Factors, uh, screens, and so on. But the good thing is that those devices started being personal devices. So it was really easy to know who was the, who is the one watching the given show. Something that uh, was pretty common. So this uh, requires high schools of transcoding, support for handhelds, mobile devices, and other things. So this was mostly the, the most important part. And finally, uh, the advent of social networking changed everything. So now, now we have a look to this. We have a recirculation of contents from users to producers, from producers to users. So this is the scenario we, we, the one we are mixing a lot of different contents, user-generated contents with uh, producer contents and these kind of things. So in the end, we have uh, different stakeholders. It's pretty fascinating. We have producers, but maybe also users, but distributor, distributors that has less importance, they are just big pipes. Okay? 
And we have users that in the end, they are no longer devices, they are real humans behind the device. So we can identify them and we can provide them, and we should provide them uh, a tailored content from an adaptation to, your, to the needs of your lives of this lives. So, we have more services, we have convergence with the internet services, especially in networking, uh, social networking, sorry, uh, and users who can act in broadcasters of the life, so this big social network. So having this, this uh, scenario in our minds was, it was, was triggered our, our development. So, uh, summary that the challenges brought by the evolution are that we have the next, the next generation of mobile devices with new form factors, uh, we know that we require transcoding. We know that the solution for transcoding is used to be closed. Then we have also that the users are now active broadcasters. They require adaptive, adaptive interfaces because web-based applications are uncomfortable for mobile devices. So we need uh, to provide them an application, putting that on the market so they can download it and use it. We require privacy because web solutions or social networking are not enough. Uh, there are a lot of different papers arguing that uh, we don't, we should not uh, upload images, personal images to social network. networks and they, they are very right. So, uh, that's a big social network. Moreover, uh, we need the real easy to manage convergence with the internet. So, there's a lot, uh, a lack of standardization when it comes to uh, user-generated content management that, uh, I mean, lead to vertical solutions at like Google TV, Apple TV, which you can download video from YouTube, you can also upload videos to their or download or upload to social networks and things like that. Moreover, um, we, we want something like it. We want more with less. We, we want just uh, user-generated cross-domain one-click mashups, meaning that I want to do something, just click, something last, uh, retrieve pictures from from my holidays from with friends, from devices friends, uh, from the devices from my friends, create a presentation with it and publish it to YouTube. So just with one click, this is a mashup. So we, we want things like that. But we also need to respect all the rights. So we need to be able to give uh, support for commercial content. So the idea is uh, that we need to be able to socialize protected content, okay? However, keeping, uh, I mean, keeping the license of the, of the content, okay? So this uh, would uh, lead to a sort of cooperation with producers, so users may also be part of the, this uh, distribution chain, okay? So I get content and I push it to a friend or another person without generating or violating the I will be part of the, of the process. So, when it comes to social networking, this is the other motivation. Uh, I have just one picture. That is, uh, I mean, it speaks by, by its own. So, from the very beginning of the world, we have been increasing our social abilities. Uh, with the explosion that was around 2004, that was the, the year in which we have a lot of different social networks, but nowadays it seems that this market is st stable, okay, and we, we all give, uh, I mean, a good importance, a good importance to, to this uh, social network, so this is what I want to show you, that, uh, I mean, social networking is still, is still uh, a very important thing. So, I have here, I, this is a slight sentence because uh, we, we, we made a social, social experiment, sorry, because I, I, I wasn't able to, to take the, the, the picture of the results. That's why I put here to explain to you. Okay. But, but I, 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 I could. What we need is just to try to find a correlation among devices of known people. So we take uh, some social networks uh, of people. I mean, we, we take a, we, we create an application and uh, put it in the market and ask a lot of students in my university to download it, okay? And we check the correlation of media 
inside their devices with the devices of their friends, social networks that belong to the same university, and the correlation was really big. It was uh, around the 80%. So they used to consume the same media, they used to share the same media with the web. So in the end, social networking is related with uh, the devices, networks, somehow, so it's, uh, it's also a good motivation. So, uh, talking about uh, cloud computing, the, but the first thing I want to do to be aware of is that, uh, is that, uh, that there is a lack of an accepted definition for this cloud computing paradigm. So, uh, there's a very good article, it's a cloud computing that's in one high behind the nebula, that uh, speaks uh, exactly about this. There's no definition for cloud computing. So, everybody understands cloud computing on its own. Okay? In any case, it is a very old concept known as computing as a utility. It was first mentioned in 1966, it's quite a long time. One thing that's clear to me and to everybody is that cloud computing can be used to abstract the state of the underlying infrastructure to reduce in so the IT costs or making um, life easier in terms of programming and deploying a solution. The thing is, uh, it, was, it, it is really a, a non concept, but now it has emerged as, as a commercial reality for many reasons. One of them is important role in the hard cost. So it's cheaper to make a, a big data center full of computers, full of routers, and anything you need is cheaper than, than, than uh, before. Also, the emergence of new applications and services that demand this kind of uh, infrastructure, infrastructure. So, there's a very good report compared to the Apple Cloud that they did really analyze this, how this happened, uh, and, why, and why now, and not before. So, this is what happens when you don't have a really a uh, concept behind the technology and you don't have such a so the thing is that everybody came up with its own solution. So we have solutions, the most popular one from Google, from Amazon, but there are many others from Microsoft, Salesforce, everybody targeting different markets. Okay? But in the end, what we have is a very big problem known in cloud computing that's called data locking. So whenever you decide to use a given framework, you're probably not able to change to another one unless you uh, I mean, unless you pay a lot of money, okay? So, in the end, cloud computer, there are some concepts around it that uh, everybody wants to, to fulfill and it's typically uh, available in every single framework. The first one is the elasticity, okay? The elasticity defined, I mean, in a generic way, is the ability to scale up, just add more resources when when, when you need them, okay, probably automatically or based on a variable you're measuring, for instance, the amount of users at a, at a given time, and also to a scale down, a scale down when you no longer need those resources. So you reduce the amount of machines taking care of your problem. Uh, one thing that, that one good, good thing we have from elasticity is that help businesses to start small. Okay? So if I'm making a new, a new website, uh, that's a very bad thing that if I fail to provide the adequate resources and my web page becomes very popular, the thing is that when I have a peak of users accessing my web page, I will I wouldn't probably be able to surf as quick as I used to do. Okay? So this gives to the to the website very bad, bad image. Okay? So the good thing that that computer provides us is a way to start small, okay? just uh, dimension our website to, for, for few users. And uh, placing a, a way to scale up automatically. So if my service become very popular and I have a peak of users, I just scale up automatically so nobody notice that I'm running out of resources. And my website is still uh, have, still has a good image. Another thing that helps to balance the load 
and also to provide an increase in laboratory PUP unit in marketing and environments. So, if I am going to spend out money in millions of machines, I would really want to, to use them as much as I can. So this is a good thing I can get from, from cloud computing. Moreover, uh, it helps us to, to make a flexible business strategies. One of the things that really triggered the, the advent of cloud computing now, not before, is a change from the old static agreement with, for instance, company of, uh, as IBM. I don't know if it's anybody from IBM in the, in the room. But, I mean, they, they, they have been doing this for a long time, making this uh, I mean, hosting large applications for third parties in their, in their uh, facilities and providing some scalability. Okay? The good thing is that now I can do that uh, in a pay-as-you-go schema. Just I swipe my credit card on a website, and it's the only thing you need to do. Whenever, some, whenever more resources are uh, allocated to me, I just pay more money. So I don't need, I don't need an agreement, nobody cares who I am. Nobody cares uh, of my application, so it's just pretty easy. Just go to Amazon and you pay for that. Anything you need to do. And I think we have another concept around that computer is the virtual, virtual unlimited storage. So we have the, we may have the impression of having an unlimited storage pretty pretty cheap. So we are storing a lot of information data centers and that can be uh, served to desktop clients, in clients and smartphones in a very good way. The thing is that uh, that company had around 40% of the IT infrastructure up in 2012. It's a, it's a, it's a big, big amount. So for those that, uh, that doesn't know about the cloud computing, you know there are three ways of, uh, of making things in cloud computing. We may go for infrastructure as a service. In what we have, what we have there is just uh, the virtualization of a personal computing, a personal computer or, or, or a server. So we have just a virtualized uh, a CPU, virtualized memory, virtualized this. The only thing we have. So we can instantiate as many as we want to have. Then we have platform as a service. It's just a full feature operating system, Linux, Windows, whatever it is, available to us. And the most uh, abstract one software as a service is the, uh, is the one that provides more, more value to the, to the user. It's uh, one in which I have an API, a set of APIs that I'm free to use them. And whenever my application demands more from the, from the server, more resources are automatically allocated for that purpose. So the good thing of software as a service is that I don't need to deal with operating systems, don't need to deal with uh, infrastructure at all. I just use an API. But it has a drawback. The drawback is the data locking problem. Whenever I choose a given API, the one from Google, the one from Microsoft, I can <coughs> not probably change to a different one. So, if you have a look to this, it can be also, I mean, uh, you can create a software as a service system, relay on platform as a service, as well as the infrastructure as a service. In the end, it's like in the So, it's possible to relay on the lower levels. So, how does that community help to this multimedia world? <coughs> so, when it comes to plain OTB, it has nothing to do. However, hybrid TV requires a lot of storage and processing. And uh, when we have a lot of different uh, devices, we need a lot of transcoding and storage. So that's why that community is interested in, in this media, media business. However, if we, if we have a uh, look to the role of the device in, in cloud computing, we, we first need to have a look to the, to the computing history. So, we used to have many time ago a thing called mainframe, that is just a central server shared with a lot of people that delivered services to small computers. So, we used to have very small computers, wasn't able to do a lot of things, so we rely on uh, a mainframe to do the, the big work, okay? the heavy work. Then uh, we, we went to the, to, to, the, to the time in which we have uh, personal computers okay, that brought uh, the ability to access local networks and internet applications seamlessly. 
since we were able to have anything we wanted to have in our computer, we didn't need a, a, a mainframe or any other thing. It was a good thing. So, since the majority of the PCs, the personal computer, was uh, misused in terms of uh, using constantly the CPU and so on, they came up with a concept called Green Computing, saying that why if we have, for instance, in a, in a university, why we have lots of computer, computers that are used just a few hours a day, why not make a grid with them so we can share this processing power and memory with many other applications? So that was the, the idea. So in the end, the computer just shares processing power and storage amongst other machines. But how about interacting with the cloud? So. Cloud computing sometimes is said to be an evolution of grid computing, okay? in which the resources are no longer limited to processing power and storage. You can share anything you want to. The thing is that the cloud leads to a concept similar to the mainframe. In the end, the, the client does not participate in the process. It's exactly the thing we used to have. We have a client that will maybe a mobile device, a personal computer, to just uh, ask for something to the cloud and then get the result. Okay? So it's exactly the same again, the same concept. So in the end, in cloud computing, we move data to the place in which we can find the processing power. Okay? But that's one problem we use frequently in this uh, cloud computing uh, paradigm. The thing is that one cost matter. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of people that are uploading their images to cloud computing constantly. So it costs a lot of money in the end. Okay, it's one cost, uh, processing cost, a lot of things. So if we, if we give a thought to the problem, the thing should be this way. If the outcome of the operation is smaller than the input to the data, the data should be processed in the cloud, uh, not otherwise. However, we use the cloud for everything. In other cases, it's moving content among personal devices. But this is, uh, we have a lot of different over-the-top services that can be used. The problem should be analyzed in detail. Okay? The thing is that that computer was, was designed for large, processing large data sets, and the end uh, end up using, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, used for everything. So, there are other worries uh, when we're using that computing. The first thing is that cloud computing systems are typically multi-tenant. So, can anybody see a problem in this? So, this, uh, the, the confidential information, personal data, maybe, and sometimes it is uh, accessed and misused. Okay. So, there's a very good page uh, in Wired, uh, I think it's Wired, the magazine Wired, and they, they, they find a lot of different hidden APIs from Dropbox. So, it was very simple to access all those information without even logging into the system. Okay? So this is what happened when using cloud computing for personal data. Another thing is the free cloud computing system that they are locked are provided as is. So it may happen you have an accident and data led you know, uh, there's a low replication so something went wrong and you 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 uh, you lose your data. And there are multiple hardware that if the cloud computing system is not well designed, probably it's going to be a problem for you also. So, uh, what about if we make our personal devices uh, part of the system? So, going back again, so the cloud brings up closer the elastic computing paradigm. However, personal devices act as client in the same way as with the mainframe. Okay? They do not participate in the operation. And the personal data should be transferred to third-party facilities that are distrusted in principle. So there's a privacy problem and high one cost. So what about making this refinement we call personal elastic computing or elastic personal computing? So the thing is why not making our devices part of the, of the infrastructure for computing? Okay? Why if I have a mobile phone and I enter my phone and I have a lot of different Devices able to process information. Why not making a computing fabric with them? Okay. Why do I need to push every single personal content to a third party that is distrusted to me in order to do something that I probably can do with 
my device is at home. Okay. Or why do I need to relay on an over-the-top service, or why do I need to relay on Facebook or any other service in order to share some content with my friends? Why do I? Is it technically impossible to do it otherwise? I don't think so. So this is what we are pursuing to make every device part of a seamlessly made computer fabric. So such elastic personal computing concept provides a computer fabric seamlessly, okay? So the personal devices participate in the process. It's able to aggregate near, or let's say, environmental resources, things I can't find uh, close to me. And it's able to aggregate also non-local resources uh, far away from me, that may be personal devices of bodies, friends, family, that they are probably retaining media I like to I like to access to. What we want is to be able to distribute operations among them, okay? And uh, in order to offload my personal device, to reduce one cost and to keep privacy. This is one of the, the most important topics. So what I'm going to show you now is the SNAs that uh, trigger the development of the elastic personal computing framework. Okay. Uh, I must say that uh, the, we, we implemented this SNA using tailored solutions. Okay, and once we finish making all this uh, this work, we noticed that having an elastic personal computing framework, we may be able to do it in a in a few in a few days. Okay, so that's why I'm going to show you this. So the first thing we we saw is that uh, there's a big challenge with user generated content. So it's complex to classify, to annotate, it's even complex to find. I sometimes have the problem that I don't remember in which device I store whatever photo. Okay, so I need to have a look to a lot of different devices until I find it and I share it through social networks and something like that. So the thing is there's a lack of interoperability to generate index for platform information, to annotate them and to even search across multiple repositories. At home. Moreover, the, there's also a problem with the web centric applications. So nowadays, uh, there are several problems that uh, at least uh, restrain me and uh, probably many of you to upload personal pictures to, to Facebook or to any other social network. If you, if you go through this article, the attack of the found photos, it, it's not really an article, it's a, it's a blog entry of a research group. They, they, made a, they made a research and they tried to find how long uh, does a, a given social network, how, how long does, uh, I mean, how, how much time takes a social network to remove your pictures from the social network when you instruct the network, the, the social network to do so. So they, they asked, uh, they, they uploaded some pictures to Facebook, uh, Twitter, many other places, and they asked again, them to remove them. So they were present up to, uh, I mean, for, for months, okay? Moreover, many of them, many of the social network didn't uh, remove the, the picture. Despite, they, they did, they required the social to, to, to remove them. Moreover, there's... Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, this is what they, they say also. They say that the, they probably keep them, keep the, the picture forever, okay? But the thing they were measuring is that uh, they, they made it public in a way. Despite I, I, I tell them, just remove this. Probably it's not in, my, in, the, in the feed of my user in Facebook, but if you go through, uh, I don't know, to the distribution network or any other thing, you can't even find the, that picture again. Yeah, I did it manually, just saying, okay, remove this image, but I, I, I think there should be something, some API to do that, but in any case, they, they, they don't respect that API, they just keep the picture, so. So you actually did that manually? Yeah. So you I, actually went into... Yeah, when I read this, this blog entry, I, 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 I tried myself to do it, and they did keep the pictures anyway. So that's the link? Yeah, that's the link. Yeah, that's the link. It's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty old, it's a pretty old thing. But I mean, uh, they, they, they publish a, a big list and nobody 
nobody will remove them. There's no session as well that removes your, your picture. You can even ask for your information to Facebook. I, I didn't uh, I didn't ask for that, but I have a colleague in the university that asked them for every 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 information they have about them. And they, they, they send this guy a two DVDs of information. Containing logs, chats, everything. So it's a good exercise to do. So uh, also the web got uh, applications uh, for sharing med media are uh, maybe com uh, uncomfortable in terms of uh, they are not ready to cope with a big amount of, uh, of media, pictures, videos and so on. So it's getting better with uh, HTML5 but it's still a bit uh, uncomfortable. I don't know. I really don't know. I think that now it's, it's becoming easy in Europe, I guess, because we have uh, more, 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 more powerful uh, laws against price and uh, for free price. But here in the States, uh, I don't know. Probably not. Uh, there are also some uh, problems with copyrights and licenses. For instance, whenever you, you make a, a content, uh, for instance, uh, I don't know, a presentation of images and you put some music on that, you're probably breaking off the graph or something like that. What I mean is that uh, you're probably able, maybe able to do that if you have a way to ask uh, whoever about, I mean, for the right to use the given song in a presentation or something like that. But this should be something very simple to use, and now this is quite common. So, so uh, the thing is that having to this sharing contest is in the small homes is straightforward. So I, I share contents with home devices easily through DNA, UPnP and many other protocols. So for instance I get the pictures from my holiday, I can push them through my camera to the TV or to the computer in a very easy way. However, sharing contents with friends is large. So it uh, requires, let's say, it's an awful lot of clicking, typing, copying, pasting and other things. And can be dangerous because of exactly that. So, if after holidays I want to share my pictures with people, I can do many things. One of them is to upload them to Dropbox, for instance, or many other storage cloud, or just uh, publish them in Facebook. So the thing is that in order to share something, I mean, if Bob wants to share something with Alice, just take the pictures, upload them to the to the PC, then to Facebook. So then Alice can go through her PC and download them to, from Facebook. So I really don't think we need this. We can make it uh, other way. So what about if we have a middleware running at every device at home that classifies media, okay, allows searching, uh, even transcoding on the fly? Okay? Something very, very easy to, to have. Just whenever I take a picture, just make an annotation, when has been taken, I provide it to, uh, to an index for searching, as Google does. Okay? So I can make a search within my own network so I know exactly in which device I can find a given picture. I can retrieve from the given device and push it to another device. I can do a lot of things in a very easy way. And it, uh, the thing is, uh, why not managing also commercial content? Be make, uh, for instance, uh, providing a secure download, transport and delivery using something as simple as a family domain. Okay, so any single content protected by license can be used in any of the of the devices at my home, whatever the I mean, it's like the license boundary. Okay, it's very very simple to to do. There are many systems that uh, already already does. For instance, uh, ultraviolet or easy PC. Yeah? So it's something that can be used in a very simple way. So what about Next, this is good for my home network, but what about if the devices in the home network constitute an instance or node of a bigger, of a bigger thing? Why not make it a cloud out of every single home network? Okay, a private cloud. So it's like it's something like a federation. So in such a way, I can just uh, leave my content, my I mean the pictures of my holidays in my network, in my devices. So my grandpa or my friend uh, Alice can access directly to the information. 
to have a federation. This is possible to do. We don't need to rely on an over the top service, we don't need to rely on a drop or something else. We can do that directly in a very easy way. So, what we did uh, when we made this application time, time ago is just uh, we brought this uh, cloud computing for storage to the home environment, so we were able to make a home network federation, okay, for sharing content, only for that. Providing, uh, I mean, a way to federate uh, friends, like-minded people, home networks, constantly in the big cloud, okay, just for the purpose of sharing content. So, we were able to provide some services to other members, uh, some more transcoding, it wasn't very, wasn't very, very complex, okay, just a few, a few things. To, to pack some pictures, just uh, I want to take the picture from whatever places and put it on the seed file. Or even uh, make some, some, some streaming, you know, the wide data network that didn't work very well. So the thing is that we just uh, collected the uh, metadata and generated this big index okay, using a technology that allows us to uh, search across multiple repositories. Okay. It was many times ago when we did this. So, in such a way, we provided uh, searching services with level of scope and ranking, so we were able to find uh, pictures directly in the home network with a given friend or my family friend network. Anything. We were able to uh, transmit to a stream this information using DNA over a pipe, okay, over a tunnel. And we were able mostly to handle commercial content, but at least to be aware that that content was had, had a license. However, in order to do it correctly, we needed uh, tamper-proof hardware, and we, we didn't have had such, uh, such hardware. So, in the end, what I want you to have with this is this is not nothing. This is nothing about the social network. It's a cloud with a storage searching operation, but that is constituted in the same way as a social network, without breaking the privacy. It's a pretty simple thing. To do. Another thing we, we did is, uh, what about when I move out outside my home network and I want to access to my, to my content, okay? So, personal devices are limited in the end, so I cannot uh, be part of the cloud when I'm outside because probably I'm going to receive a lot of signaling requesting contents to my device that probably I'm going to join my battery, okay? So, uh, and I will probably find any other way more uh, reliable or more uh, to transmit uh, to a stream give content. Okay? So what we did is uh, in the end to for instance when, it, when, I, when we are at the hotel we just uh, want to access to our personal content in the, in the cloud, in our personal cloud, we use a gateway, okay, this is uh, one solution we did that we make the request, the traffic request to the gateway, the gateway the gateway asks to the personal cloud and then once the gateway gets the content, it delivers through a, probably a most efficient technology, PBBH or any other thing. So I still have access to my stuff in a reliable way, in an efficient way, without breaking the, the privacy. So I don't need to uh, push a movie to a storage cloud in order to see that movie outside my home. So, uh, however, we face some concerns for making this nomadic access to personal cloud. Uh, the gateway may belong to a, to a network operator, uh, operator or maybe shared a shared computer. So, where, whereas my main cloud belongs to me and to my trusted people, so the gateway is entrusted anyway. If I'm going to push personal content through it, it's not a good idea. So, the thing is, the nature of the user generated content is sensitive in the end. So, probably pictures from kids or family is not a good thing to share with a gateway you don't trust. So, we, we made a design, uh, I don't have the text here because if not it's going to be a brilliant presentation, that we, we were able to uh, retrieve the content in a secure way and even making this gateway able to uh, transfer the content or to stream the content using the content protection system. Uh, in such a way, the gateway wasn't able to know what I was searching or looking for, okay, and what was the content I was streaming to it. So, if you have more, if you want to know more, more I will tell you later. So, 
in the end, the idea is to, to provide an efficient way to access the information from outside this personal cloud, okay? providing adequate security so that the cloud should encrypt the information in a compatible way with the transmission technology that we are going to use, uh, the DBH, uh, MBMS, any other thing. So it's it can be done. Okay? So I'm taking my stuff from my own cloud and I'm making a third party to stream it in a secure way. It's a good thing to have. So we get a good privacy, okay? Because the cloud, is, the cloud is obfuscating search results and anything, so nobody knows what I'm looking for. So, uh, what about uh, using our personal cloud to share images, videos, and personal things through a social network? Can it can be done? Yes, it can be. So, the thing is that the application you know are commonly linked to social networks, so again, uh, big concern about using this uh, social networking for user generated content. One thing that really triggered this process, this project, because it was part of uh, uh, something. I mean, somebody required us to do this because there's a the, there's a, a big problem with the protection of minors in, in Facebook and in other social networks. So the thing is that minors may be uploading uh, pictures to social networks. Since they are not going to remove them, even if you ask them to do so, we have a big problem. Okay. So uh, what we did is to make a, to make up this media cloud, this personal media cloud, so our private cloud, uh, a private storage for social networking. Okay. So what we do is that what we did is a, is a following. We made some uh, plugins for for many different browsers, Google Chrome, and also for uh, I guess for Internet Explorer. Okay. So the thing is that uh, you were able to take a picture, okay, that was stored in your media cloud, in the cloud you're sharing with your family and friends. Okay. So uh, if you want to share this image with uh, your, your your friends. Just uh, what you do is to upload a, a, a fake, okay, to the social network. A fake is just a picture, probably with no content or something, but has some embedded metadata, okay. Or probably using steganography, you place the link to the media cloud node in which it's located, and that media cloud node is private, so you are not really uploading your picture to the social network. However, Nobody notice when a, when a friend of you access to the social network, the plugin that is inside his browser automatically takes the picture from the private cloud and replace the one taken from Facebook with that picture. So it's seamless. To upload the picture as any other picture, but the picture really is really located in your network. Nobody knows about that. So. The, I mean, the, the traffic of the social network is in a different layer and it's the traffic of the private cloud. So it's a very good way to, to obfuscate your information using the power of the social network to share your data with others, okay? but without breaking your, your privacy. So uh, then we went, uh, we, we started making some phishing transcoding projects uh, in which uh, we, we needed to make a lot of videos for different form factors and resolutions. So what we did is to, I mean, to, to use the cloud to provide a, a lot of different versions of content, okay, using map reviews. I, I will tell you about that later. So uh, the thing that we, we found some challenges, so Transcoding uh, requires a lot of processing power. Okay, uh, nowadays it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's able to make some sort of transcoding using a mobile phone. Okay, but in the end, you need to do a lot of different transcoding, uh, batch transcoding. You need a lot of processing power. And the idea was to distribute this using cloud. Okay, in two ways. One was to use a provided cloud to make a tailored versions to uh, be distributed through. through uh, I mean, User, to, to users. Another one was to uh, allow users to make their own versions of the protected content and load them back to the So uh, we, we found that there are many, many solutions that are closed, are private, so there's no, no way to, to instantiate that in a different place. So 
We found a good one, it's called a split of merch that fragments the video in many small pieces and distribute the load, the workload among many different computers. So every single computer does just transpose a small part of the video. Okay, and then another computer collects every single piece of, um, of video and put it all together in a single video. Okay. The thing that we, we found that is uh, the good point of this work is there's no federation of transport. This is a good thing. I mean, this is a bad thing, sorry. Uh, the thing is that it's a lack of solution that allows third parties to consume immediate transcoding results. So what about transcoding, uh, I don't know, a, a, a direct show, a show that is uh, being extremely direct. So I, I fail to transcode that, but I have many immediate results. Can anybody take those immediate results and finish the work? Now it's okay. So what we do is that uh, we, we, we create a, a way to do, to do that using map and reduce. So in such a way that, that uh, if, uh, if part of the cloud fails or if, uh, if, a, if, a, if an entire cloud fails and you are able to transfer all the intermediate work to another place, other can finish this uh, transcoding process. So we can now make this uh, federation of transcoders in order to create new versions. We, we call it open cloud transcoding. And uh, finally, the, the, the fourth SNA we, we, we were uh, taking into account well, is what about user or community driven transcoding? What about if I take a content from, from the producer, I legally respecting the license, I make a new version using my computer or the computer of many people, okay, I provide high quality uh, content. What about if I push it back to the producer and I get some revenue, right? some points for buying new content and new stuff. So it's pretty simple. So I'm offloading the provider, uh, the provider network, I'm making my own version for whatever device, and I'm sharing that legally with other people. So the thing, these are the, the four SNAs that, that triggered this design. The thing is that when we, when we made this, uh, we, we use uh, tailored solutions, we start from the beginning, making all the work. And in the end, we will notice that something, uh, if, we, if, we, if we had a framework for that, we may have, uh, I mean, it may have been easy to, 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 to do. So that's why we, we make this lightweight, map reduced framework. So, the thing is, is that having in mind these, uh, these scenarios, so what do we want to have? So the thing is that we want to have a computing fabric that provides computing, I mean, uh, a system to provide the computing fabric seamlessly. So I want to use any personal device, mobile phones, computer, tablets, uh, why not STBs, even TVs, anything, okay, to constitute a computing fabric that can be used by other applications to offload and to distribute the workload among these nodes. Okay? And I want obviously make this my personal devices to participate in the process. Okay? The thing is that state-of-the-art devices are very, very, very powerful, so it's not a, something strange. So I, I, I may uh, aggregate resources in, in my local area network as well as resources that are outside my network. This is the, the idea. So, how to do this? So first of all, uh, I want some sort of data management. So if we have a look to the, I mean, we, we, we remember what we were discussing in the beginning, uh, distribute operation involves software, the software I'm going to use, and the data set over which uh, this operation should be performed. Okay? So in current in like cloud systems, the data is uploaded or placed or moved where the processing power is located. So uh, to a large facility. However, personal devices uh, retain, uh, as, I, as I tell you, uh, a lot of data that may be correlated with uh, many other people's devices. So uh, if I'm going to perform an operation of a, of a data set, it's probably that uh, if I'm going to use the device of a friend, that uh, friend's device always uh, probably has already that information stored in their, in their, in their storage. Uh, so, uh, also we need to 
take uh, care that moving data through one address of the host and how to deal with it. So, when using environmental resources in the, the local the network, this is, this is inexpensive, okay? But uh, the non local devices that are far away uh, may be also used whenever they have already the data stored. So, uh, the thing is that we're going to change the, the cloud paradigm a bit. Instead of moving the data where the processing power is, what we are going to do is to move the software where the data is. Okay. The thing is, since personal devices has a lot of information, media files, and the social characters of uh, personal devices uh, allows to scale up, meaning that uh, I may use another device that already has that information. This is a uh, data management. As I told you, the, the correlation among the data of related devices is high. So, how can be related to the device? So, a device belonging to a single user, if, you have, if I have many devices that belong to me, probably I will have a replicated information in those devices. I, I usually make copies of my photo collections to, to certain devices. So, if I, not, if I need to make an operation over those pictures, I know I can do that at least with three or four devices. Without moving a piece of data, they already have that picture stored. Okay. Moreover, uh, my friends may have a lot of uh, pictures, media in common with me. Okay. Even people that are like minded or probably belongs to the same distribution group or have the same WhatsApp group or things like that may have a lot of media in common. Okay. So I can, I can find a big correlation among different devices. And this is what I'm going, going to, to, to explore, okay? So since uh, I, don't, I don't want to move data, I just want to move software, I need to do that just to, I need to move the software only to those devices that already have the data. So the thing is, uh, we want to make a resource application, putting near local resources, I call them environmental resources, okay? And also all the resources that are far away, okay? And we want to distribute operation among these devices. The thing is that we also may uh, specify a collection point and other devices and third party devices that is going to receive the result of this operation. For instance, uh, I may use my mobile phone to require to request an operation, for instance, let's say collect individual images from several devices from for, I don't know, from, hol from holidays, and use the TV as the collection point. So I will probably sit it in the in the room of my home with my friends. Uh, every of my friends have some pictures. We, uh, we want to see them all together. So I just can request with a single click, take all those pictures, push it to the TV. I don't need to collect them first and then place in a single place and then go to the TV. You know, it can be done automatically. Or the collection point can be also a group of devices make a presentation out of uh, different pictures and send it to the, I don't know, to the devices of my friends, to all of them. So we also want to keep privacy. So as I told you, cloud computing offers popular services for storage, media manipulation and communication, but that's a big problem with user-generated content. The first one, general services are provided under a common uh, type of service. Okay? And rarely, rarely users read this, uh, the service level agreement or, or I mean, or the privacy problems you may have using the social media or nobody reads that. They could say, okay, accept, and goes to start using the cloud. So in the end, you need to blindly trust the cloud provider. So you, have, uh, you don't have a tool to control the, 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 the behavior of the provider. Okay? And you can even verify the provider assertions. They have the architecture, security processes, so I'll say you, 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 you can uh, check anything. So, we want privacy, but we are going to use uh, others' devices, not necessarily, not, not only my devices. So, however, sharing personal media among related devices, devices of friends, of family, isn't that, that dangerous in The thing is that. Uh, it's a pre-existing trust relation. So I have a pre-existing trust relation with my, with my sister. So if I use the device of my sister, it's not that dangerous if I 
push that picture to a social media. So it's simply in, in, any, in any case that there's always a risk, okay? but it's not that big in this kind of system. And I think we want to want to use we want to have an easy to use API so anybody can make an application to be used with this lightweight markup uh, framework. Okay. So uh, when we when we had a look to this, uh, I mean when we started this this project, we said, okay, how to do this? So we went through the three types or the three common types of uh, structure in cloud computing. So the first thing we saw is virtualization. So virtualization is very simple to use. It's, uh, it's very reusable in terms of because say, if I if I have a even a virtual machine in every single device, I can. I mean, I don't care about the device. Okay? However, it's not that efficient. So the thing is that it requires uh, commodity hardware, and that's not feasible with personal devices, as in the and many other forms. Okay. There's another way to do it that is uh, using an operating system framework. It's having a uh, kind of uh, sub operating system running or another operating system running parallel to your device so you can put your, your solution. But this is only this is also not not, not, not feasible nowadays. Yeah. So we went through finally that the last model is the software as a service. And we say okay, this provides a high abstraction. This may be uh, this, this may have a problem of data logging. So anybody that uses our API is going to is probably not be able to use the application in that place. Okay. However, it's the it's the best one because can be implemented in any OS platform or device. And allows the hardware to be able to use. So this is a good thing. And I must say that despite we are using software as a service. Since we are relying on app reviews, okay, there's a way of making programs. In the end, we, I mean, we are able to, anybody is able to, re to, to reuse its application in, in, in the place. So finally, so our choice was uh, programming a communication model, so using software as a service, using app reviews, this close to software as a service. So when we started this, this development, we had a look to have, I don't know if you are aware of having. It's a, it's a project from, uh, it's, a, it's an open source project, it's a framework for storage and large scale processing of data sets in a cluster of, of uh, average hardware. Okay. It was developed from, from the paper Google uh, published many, many time ago, which uh, they described the map of use and uh, the interface. So they, they, they went, I mean, with the years they, they, they made a big, a big thing. So I say the big guy because he is, he's able to do a lot of things. So it uses MapReduce to to distribute applications, okay? And we, we had a look to it because of that, because it was, was a source for inspiration, okay? In the case, it's uh, it's uh, composed of several modules. I have a Apache Common, uh, sorry, have a Common that contains libraries and utilities. Okay, we have the distributed file system. A state of the art, uh, highly distributed replicated file system okay, that provides a very high replicate bandwidth. And they have the map reviews uh, stack, so we can, you can make an application with map reviews and distribute it in a cluster in a very easy way. So, uh, the thing is that Hadoop, in Hadoop, all the modules are designed to cope with several, several problems. So, they they have in mind that hardware fails, failures are, are, are frequent. Okay? So they need to make a, a software implementation that is able to work even if part of the cluster crashes. Okay? So for that they, they use a replication strategy for the data in order to uh, be able to rebalance or, or move the work to another different node. So they 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 use this, uh, I mean they they say that this framework can be used with very and inexpensive disks and hardware. So they, they tolerate a lot of uh, disk failures per second. So they just uh, take the disk out, they swap. I mean they make a new, they put a new one, and, it's, and this, this works in a way. So it's a it's a very good software. So uh, the thing 
is that they, they know that the, they, they, they have a, a big control of the, of the IP addresses of the machine. How it knows in which rack and within that rack in which position is a given piece of data allocated. It's easy to, to have. Okay. So the data replication is rack aware, as they call them, rack aware. Uh, so they are able to uh, distribute the load, I mean the, the workload, using this data awareness. So they send the work to those nodes that already have the data stored. Okay. In such a way, uh, they reduce the load of the traffic that goes over the network and prevents any unnecessary data transfer. And they use this API for communication. So we, we have a look to this before starting making our own framework. Yeah. To have a look to it, they, they have just two layers. They have a layer for the data, is the HDFS layer, okay? And they have the map reduce layer. They have the job tracker, the task tracker, uh, in, in a given node, the one that starts the job, okay? And any other node receiving part of the workload only has a task tracker. So the thing is that the job tracker uh, submits, I mean the client application submits the map reduce work to the job tracker, okay? And the job tracker divides that work into small pieces and distributes them to the different slaves, okay? So every slave has a task tracker that executes, executes that, that uh, task. And there's a heartbeat in order to know uh, the, the status of the work and to know if a given node has have failed or is down in between. So this is uh, how, how it works. However, what do we need? The thing is that uh, our, our view of the problem is obviously different. We are not going to deal with a large scale uh, data center. We want to distribute the load among small devices. So we need to have a look uh, clearly to that. So, uh, what we are going to do is that devices that were former clients are now participants and they are small devices. Okay. So this lightweight map reduce framework is going to is going to offload the personal device. Okay. How? Using what we call job slide here that are other devices okay, running this framework that are going to accept this work. How we are going to make this work? We are going to call it a job. Okay. It's a set of operations, probably using an API, overtake a set. The one that starts the job is a job originator, and the one that executes a piece of that work is a job slice executor. And there's one thing that is different from Hadoop, we change the, the, the device receiving the work. We change, we add a new element that is called the collection. So the collection point is the device or devices that are going to receive the outcome of the operation. Okay. So this is more or less the picture. Many uh, jobs like a secure, many of them distributed in different networks, a job originator, and a collection point that should be different. So uh, having that in mind and uh, knowing how uh, how it works, okay, we uh, follow this design principle. So. The, 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 the difference with Hadoop is that uh, the job slide secures uh, in our case can move, can change the location, can change the connectivity of the IP. So we don't have such a rack to where storage they, they have. So because we don't know uh, if the device is going to be present at a given time, where is it, if it's going to move or not, any other thing. So we, we solve that using a central service, okay? Like, uh, I don't know, like many of the messaging services as uh, WhatsApp, you know, I think, in which uh, you can check for for your your, your bodies uh, using central server. Okay? So the thing is that uh, we use a server in which every single node can check it. The thing is that a node, a mobile phone, a computer, laptop, whatever, checking checks in in the central server whenever it starts the lightweight mobility service. When this service is started but you change the network address, okay? And these uh, devices are registered with the phone number, the email, the Facebook account, and the Google account. Why? Because imagine that you have uh, an application that is dealing with, uh, I don't know, Facebook, uh, with, with Facebook people, okay? Or you're going to make a media operation that maybe uh, the people you have on Facebook is going to be interested, okay? 
So the idea is that you make a search for available nodes using your Facebook account. Okay? Because uh, you will probably uh, find more devices containing the media over the ones you're going to make this operation if you go if you use the Facebook, the Facebook profile instead of using another profile. So the thing is that to, we try to uh, make some sort of clustering with your uh, possible nodes. So using this central service, the device can find the trusted nodes in a, a single social node. Okay. Then we're going to change, I mean, we're going to implement the data node in a different way as, as Hadoop. Okay. So every device running the, this framework is going to have uh, an implementation of the data node. In the case of Hadoop, uh, there's just one data node. Okay. Okay, there's, there's a data node per, uh, per cluster, okay, but there's just one name node. We're going to put everything together. The name node and the data node that used to be that way we had to, we are going to combine them into a, into a single thing we are going to call it data node. Okay? Since every single device is able to start or to receive part of the work, okay, we need to put them together. So we're going to have just one of uh, these. This uh, data node provides data splits or pieces of data okay, to other components within the node and accept also queries from outside, from other devices, to find out if a given device contains a piece of data over, over, one, over which uh, I can make an operation. Okay. So it's possible to split the data, to save data using files, using the collection of split, okay, or using file plus split reference, for instance. I have a video file, and what I have is a split reference, just uh, telling that this split, this part of the, of the data, is just from the minute one to minute five. So I don't need to break physically the file, I just put a reference, okay? And you can also have a file, for instance, a video file, and a set or a collection of references. So one per, uh, from one uh, key frame to another key frame, and things like that, okay? references. So uh, why having these uh, different storage mechanisms? So think about text file, okay? If you have a text file, you can divide it into individual bytes, right? You can divide it in an array of regions of information, an array of bytes, but you can split it using letters. Okay, as many as, as you have, you can use words. You can use it, you can split it using lines or even paragraphs. Okay, so why having a lot of different ways to uh, split the information? Because it depends on the application. It really depends on the application. So if you are going to, to count words, the words of a text, it would be better to divide the text into words the words first, okay, rather than uh, in bytes or any other thing, okay. So this way of uh, splitting data before distributing the workload is uh, application specific. Okay? That's why we support a lot of different ways to do that. So the chart driver node uh, takes the appropriate nodes and, uh, and pushes the, the work to, to them, okay? send it the job to job slides. So for communication, we use it. Uh, Hadoop uh, uses uh, raw TCP/IP. What we are going to work, we are using HTTP. We are using different ports and virtual hosts, alternately, and alternatively. Sorry, in order to distinguish different uh, instances inside the given node. So the, the, the data node, the job tracker, the job site is new. So for the communication, every message may contain uh, an HTTP message that may contain a host header for the V host, the virtual host. Support, custom headers, a simple payload that is just a JSON uh, containing the command, the parameters, and a request identifier uh, using the RFC 412. But it also uh, may contain a complex payload whenever you need to move part of the data or just uh, the, the software. You can have a JSON payload, a data slices, and a JPEG. When it comes to security, we are using authentication of association based in claims, set of claims, attribute of value, using, and then we push that using a modified TLS version. To enforce privacy, uh, we are using a technology that is called pervasive trust management manager that uh, gives uh, trust values to devices. So uh, depending on the, operate, uh, the operation you're going to, to make, or a given data set, you may require a given trust value to, to be done. So that's why we, we use this. 
sorry if I go a bit uh, quick over this because uh, we're running out of time. So how are devices grouped to make a, 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 distri a distributed job? So we have two different attributes. One is the affinity that measures the probability of the node to accept a job based on a previous history. Okay. It measures the correlation among devices for comparison okay, and is stable at the time. And the availability that measures how available is the device uh, is provided directly uh, to the job originator or using the central service. Okay. I can update my availability and my battery or anything. This parameter changes frequently. So depending on these two, the affinity and availability, I may select you know, the set of nodes in order to perform a distributed application. So, this is the architecture of the system. We have a job manager, that also called um, sometimes job tracker, okay? That distributes the load among uh, different nodes, okay? Uh, according to the information provided to the job executor manager, this job executor manager is collocated with the job manager in this presentation. Sorry for that. So, uh, the thing is that critical jobs may require high high affinity and high availability scores, okay? But other tasks may be given more to grants and you can see the task. The thing is that this job man uh, manager sets the data availability for a particular job, notifies selected nodes, okay, and split the job according to the data nature and assigns uh, jobs like a scooter to the Data manager that keep a list of the data sets available to be used. Okay, so every time every item within the data set is given a unique identifier based on, based on hash. Okay, so it's very easy to, to, to find a like, piece of data. So the way that data is split is domain specific, application specific. Okay. Then we have the job slide executor manager that keeps a list of candidate uh, GSC nodes in order to be used to, to distribute the workload. Okay. Uh, this job like here again in this implementation is collocated with the job manager. And a job like here that just executes the job slide. So just uh, some details of the implementation. We implemented that in, okay. implemented that in Android. Uh, is the Using these three versions can be is available for gingerbread, ice cream sandwich, and kick cards. Okay, you can use it. The communication is using HTTP, using JSON, and we have several built in APIs you can use for many words. One is for text, it's pretty simple. In the end, it's just, it's just an um, experiment. Uh, for counting words, counting letters, or things like that. Uh, some for mathematics to perform mathematical calculations over a set of notes. It's pretty funny to see many other forms trying to, to find uh, prime numbers or things like that. And one we work to work with contact. Just uh, something like, uh, do you know uh, which is the owner of this mobile phone? Okay, so you just uh, send around to your devices or to the devices with your friends uh, the number and they answer you back with the name of the person. But the, the powerful part is that we have support for custom for custom applications. So whenever you follow an API, you can make your own application and distribute this in that big executable. So uh, this is more or less the, the, the diagram is pretty simple. Whenever you have a job that you have an input split, it's the way you uh, you break data into small pieces, okay? You have a way to assign map uh, assign map keys and map uh, values, also the reduce keys and the reduce values. And then the only thing you need to make is to create your job, to create a mapper, a reducer, a record reader that assigns a, a map and a key value to a given split, a given part of the data. Okay? And then you have the input splitter that takes physically the data and make it uh, pieces. Okay? And finally the collector point is the one getting the, the result. As you saw, uh, every single uh, item inside the, the, the node, the job tracker, the data node, and the job stack executor is nothing but uh, an HTTP server that accepts uh, queries, uh, accepts uh, requests, and send responses. Okay. Uh, just uh, have a look. Uh, if you know anything about Hadoop, this is more or less the same API. 
So any application you make for Hadoop, you can do it. You can use it in with your mobile phone. Okay. We follow my more or less the same exactly the same API. Okay. So it's pretty simple to find uh, an open source application that do whatever a operation over a given data and use it with your mobile phone. So as I told you, uh, the APIs we have, uh, we have several splitting tools. We are able to, I mean, we can have a text splitter, we have a word splitter, line splitter, image splitter that uh, I mean, uh, breaks the image into regions, okay? Another one for video, another one for video interval that uh, makes pieces of a given video using, I mean, from one keyframe to the next keyframe. So you are able to break the uh, video in, in small pieces, significant pieces, because you are doing that from one keyframe to the, to the next and distribute this to the, to the rest. And um, we have several APIs, just as I told you, uh, for text tools, mathematics, and so, whenever, I mean, if you want to make your, your application in a way, you can relay of anything contained inside the Android micro machine. That is called that, uh, that big machine. The only thing you need to do is just to make uh, your own jar, your own application, and create a test. You create a text using a command that is present in every single Android SDK. It's as simple as this. And then you get the job and you can put it inside your data node and you can distribute this to very in a very easy way. So just to, to show you an example, we make a word count using a lot of different uh, Android uh, terminals. Okay. So we distributed two books to several nodes in text play. One was the Adventures of Hathor Ruffin and the other one was the Odyssey. The Odyssey. So uh, we distributed that, the data node added uh, these uh, two books to to all these databases, and we make we build them up with use application in order to count the words. Okay, so uh, the job manager selects among the available nodes those that has already that contains the book inside their storage. Okay, and it queries nodes for availability. Here's an example. So I query for an input data. That's the first one with the URD is the library free book, and the other one is the the Odyssey. So then I get an answer saying, okay, uh, for every single node, telling me that yes, I have this book stored in my file system, so I can accept the job. Okay. So the thing is that the job manager is through the stack with the splitter on how to split the data. Okay. Typically, we use split references, just uh, from this part of the data to this other part. Okay. So we use a text file splitter. Uh, splitter that, uh, I mean, and instead of using words and other thing, we just made splits of 80, 80 characters. Then, we, we uh, distributed the work and it was executed. So, here you have uh, the input splitter. As you can see, the input splitter is pretty simple. You just have, uh, the only thing you need to do is to, to take the, the data, okay, it's a data file, and call text splitter telling which is the start and which is the end. The text splitter is, uh, I mean, the, this start and end depends on the, uh, what are you doing. If you are making, uh, I mean, if you are uh, splitting words, you need to say the amount of words you want in a given split. Okay, so it's in letters, in, this, in our case of chapter, we say it from zero to 80. So we start making small pieces of the data until we have all the references. When we have that, the job manager sends the work slices uh, to the job executor, uh, job slices executor. So the thing is that we get the list of available nodes, okay? And we just uh, make a lightweight map reduce request and send the, the job to the different nodes, okay? Uh, and finally, every single node performs the map and reduce operation. The map, in order to count words, this is pretty simple. So we have uh, the, this is the map key, the map value, okay, the collector, and the information about the job. What we do is very simple. We just uh, start collecting the, I mean, start having a look to the, to the split where we, we, we have been assigned by the job manager, okay? And for every single word, 
we just uh, have a look to the, I mean, we will store here the words and try to find, I mean, and for every single word we emit this new integer value, one, okay? So we find the word uh, hello, we put a one, and we send that to the collector, okay? But uh, we do that with every, uh, with every word, okay? So in the end, the collector, the only thing that we need to do is to reduce this. So whenever you receive the information, it's going to be a word with a value. One time, two times, three times. So the other thing you need to do is to sum them up. And you will have finally the collection of keys that would be words and how many times they appear in these two books. I know this is a very simple application, okay, but it works, can be distributed over a big population of smartphones. Okay? The thing, uh, you can do this with any other thing. I mean, you can, we, we did that for a split video of a principle. So you can go as complex as you want to. Depends on how you split the data, how you create your map videos, because the rest is going to be uh, done by the framework. Okay, it's pretty simple. So, just uh, the conclusion, so having it back to the present scenarios, remember the private cloud can be done with this framework in a very easy way. Okay? Uh, the media gateway is also, it, it also can be done with, like, like we make uh, map reduce framework by making the gateway part of the, of the cloud. The transport in the scenarios can be implemented easily using this solution. We did that, by the way. So, uh, this type of my reduce system can cope with any other information in the So, single framework for the Excel solution, use of software, and to do, do, I mean, to me, it's easy to use. Okay? Once you know how to use my reduce, it's pretty simple. So, the thing is that uh, with the time, with the years, uh, after making a lot of different exercises of uh, frustration, we came up with this. Uh, a uh, lightweight map reduce framework that really works for everything we have been doing for these years. Okay, so the thing is that we now can say that we, we were able to, to bring this elastic engineering concept to, to the reality. Uh, yeah, and in, a, in the near future it's going to be very pretty simple to, to go to a room and just uh, automatically make this fabric uh, in a very easy way. So, um, so yeah, uh, this is uh, everything I have uh, prepared for the tour. You have. So I would like to thank Danny for his interesting uh, tutorial. Uh, are there any questions to ask? Please go with it.